God's arm. God gave you that law. It's in, it's in the Old Testament. Thief rips you off, he owes you back ten times or seven times more. Now, get the figure in your mind that you've been ripped off and times that by seven. But unless you know it and believe it, you got to go after that. You know what I mean? You go after it. How many of you know now that you're due seven times that amount? Amen. Do you really know it? Yes. Go after it in the spirit. Demand that it's given back to you. Because God said. God said. Not because you're saying it. Because God said it. I'm going to tell you real quick, I had a keyboard stolen. How many of you knew me when my keyboard was stolen a few years ago? Okay. Okay, well, I knew this truth, that, that I'm due back seven times when it's taken from me. And when my keyboard got stolen, first of all, I had to deal with the angels on that, because, you know, how many of you know that God puts angels in charge of you? And I'm like, excuse me, where were you and my keyboards are getting stolen? <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting because I know that and I believe that and that's how I live so I went to the Lord and I said God you know I'm good you, you know I, I, actually I'm not good with this my keyboard was stolen and you have appointed angels to watch over me what happened really what happened there and the Lord said to me don't worry I have it taken care of and I'm like okay but I wasn't satisfied so the next day I went back to him and I go, I know you have it taken care of, but your word says that you'll give angels charge over me. What happened? I need to know what happened. And not only do I know that, I know that they're given to me to do, my, to do your bidding. They're servants of mine. The Bible teaches that angels are your servant. So first of all, they were there when my thing got stolen. That's not good. Okay. Second of all, they're my servant. I need it back. Okay. Now, I know it sounds really cocky to some of you, but that's how I live my life. I know the truth. And I'm this daughter of God. And I got ripped off. And my angel, where were you? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to prayer, and I don't pray to the angels, but I do talk to them. And I said, look, you just go get it and bring it back to me, and we'll call it even. Because someday I have to judge you. And it ain't looking good for you. <laughs> Doesn't the Bible say we judge angels? Yes. Wow. yes. Which yes. ones do you think you're going to judge? The ones who serve us. The ones that are serving you. <laughs> I'm not being cocky. I'm being honest. This is what the Bible teaches. So I had a discussion with my angel. I said, I don't know where you were the day my keyboard got stolen, but you need to go get it back. And if you do that and give it back to me, we'll call it even. And you know, two days later, I got my keyboard back. Two days later. And the way that happened was my husband was at the internet working on, and the Lord said, or an angel probably told you this, look on Craigslist, it's on there. So he goes right on to Craigslist, sure enough, my keyboard's there. They're asking 400 bucks for it. So my husband calls up like he's going to buy it for his wife. We do this sting operation. It was awesome. <laughs> so we go way down in this little dungeon. Uh, seriously, it's like a black market for keyboards or something. And it was the only thing back there. And it was, it was underneath. We had to go down these stairs. And it was like one little light bulb. It's like a movie hanging over my keyboard. And I acted so surprised. Like, oh, honey, really? You're going to get this for me? And so anyway, I'm like testing it, and I went on, did some programs, and it was mine because I had some recorded stuff on it, and it was there. So anyway, long story short, we had alerted the police to the fact before we went there that we were going to go get our keyboard back. So long story short, do you know how many days it took after I told my angel to go get my keyboard till I got it back? Two days. Two. But the Bible says that you're to be paid back seven times more. Wow. So I was not satisfied with just my keyboard. Now, that keyboard was probably worth about four, five hundred dollars, maybe six or seven at the most. So if you times that by seven, do the math. Right? About forty, forty, nine hundred dollars, five thousand dollars. We began to call that in, and one week later we were given that entire sound system back there. Wow. Wow. 
which is on the on the used market, probably good for about five or ten thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. I say that to say, and that has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. But I say that to say the point is we've got to know the truth. That's right. You've got to know who you are and what you deserve. So anyway, that's just a side note. So let's just pray. God, in Jesus' name, you're raising up a people that know who they are and that know who you are in us and that we know our authority and in love and all the fruit of the Spirit back behind it, we get to rule and reign on the earth. And we get to decide. You said life is ours and death is ours. You said the present is ours and you said the future is ours. Everything belongs to us. And God, I ask you that you would make us a people that understand that we are going to reign with you on the earth someday. And we are going to reign with you in the heavens, in your kingdom. So teach us how to reign now. Train us for reigning. And we just thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so tonight, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now. It's an elementary teaching, but how many of you know nothing in the heavenlies there is elementary? We just think it's elementary because we know it, but not really. We don't really know it. Do you know what I'm saying? We know a little bit about it. And so as I was praying, because see, what we're gearing up for right now is we're gearing up for bringing in the harvest. We've been talking about the harvest, right? We've been talking about the harvest, and um, but how many of you know that to bring in the harvest, how many of you have been here when I was talking about the harvest? Anybody? How many of you were here when I talked about hell? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm building on something here, because I really believe that we're entering into 2013. We're still at the end of 2012, and we're in preparation stage. Because when we begin to go out and bring the harvest in, I don't want it to just be a cute little thing that lasts for like a couple weeks. This is something God's mobilizing in Reno for the greatest harvest you've ever seen. But it's going to be because we've learned how to be harvesters. We've learned how to take the tools from heaven and bring them and make them, bring them into our life. Okay? So, so this is all gearing up for the greatest thing that God's going to be doing. But he's got to have people that get it. You know, they've got to have a heart for it. They've got to be prepared. They've got to know what to do once they get it. So tonight I want to talk to you about the baptism of fire. Okay? Yeah. How many of you, um, just by a show of hands, actually uh, believe that they have the baptism of fire with the evidence of speaking in the heavenly language? Awesome. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So this is good because we're not only going to activate it even deeper in our lives tonight, but we're going to explain it. There's actually scientific proof. How many of you know that God takes science? He created science. Yes. Uh, amen. Yes. So everything scientific yes. will eventually match up with the word because the word was first. Right. And then science he uses actually to prove his yes. word. Right? Man takes science and tries to disprove his word and can't do it. Right? Science is the study of God's glory. So God created science to prove his word through his glory, through man and the study of that. So what we're going to do is uh, I'd like you to open up your Bibles and I'd like you to uh, turn to uh, Matthew 3.11. Matthew 3.11. And this is, I'm going to touch on the baptism of fire, and a little bit about the baptism of water. Who has been baptized in water here? Okay, very good. And some not yet. Okay. Just so you know, I was baptized in fire before I was baptized in water. Yes. So there's really no order, although the word lays out an order just because everything was so new, that everything was just the first thing on the scene, so God did it the way he did it. But the Holy Spirit is no respecter. And he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, as long as it's all in the Word. So I was saved, got baptized in fire, and then was baptized in water a year later. Isn't that cool? Okay, so there's really no particular order, although both of them are needed. Okay? 
So Matthew 3.11, this is John talking, and he says, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he's coming after me is mightier than I am, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Say fire. 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 Now we talked about hell the last couple weeks, and there's some fire there too, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And and um, and our dear brother here has uh, had a word that the fire and the passion of God. God has a fire that counteracts the fire of hell, yeah. and this fire is brought by Jesus only. Yes. Jesus is the only one who baptizes you with fire. Okay. Um, the word repentance there simply means to change your mind. That's all it means. So when John was saying. Um, I'm going to baptize you with water for your repentance, but he's coming after me as my dear, and he's going to baptize you with fire. John is saying, okay, when you change your mind about the kingdom, then I'll, dunk you, then I'll baptize you in water to show the world that you've changed your mind about how you think about the kingdom of God. Because remember, he was talking to Pharisees, right? He's talking to Pharisees in the crowd that are very Jewish and very religious. And he's saying, you people need to change your mind about God and the kingdom. And when you do that, I'm going to show everybody that you've done that. And I'm going to baptize you in water. And, there, and that's why John says, oh, yeah, you guys think you want, you need to bear fruit with your changing of your mind. You want to say you're repenting? You want me to baptize you? Bear fruit and show me that you've changed your mind on the kingdom. Because the way you're acting right now doesn't show me you've changed your mind. You're still acting the old way. So the baptism of water is necessary. But it shows us, it shows the world that you've changed your mind about the kingdom. And now you're thinking kingdom principles. Okay? Mark 1.4. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching the baptism of repentance. Or preaching the baptism of to show that you've changed your mind about the kingdom of God. And you've come back to his thinking. That's what that means. Uh, Acts 2.38. Peter said to them, repent. Change your mind about the kingdom. And each of you be baptized. And what he's talking about there, be baptized in water. To show the world that you've changed your mind. Okay? In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's two there. You have to be baptized in water to show, to, I believe, to, to, to show the people that you are thinking now God's way, and you've changed your mind about what you think about whatever you used to think about. It's over now. <laughs> okay? You're showing the world. The Bible also teaches when you go down in water, it's a symbol of dying with Christ on the cross and being risen to new life. It's, it's essential that you get baptized in water. Okay? Now, if you were to, uh, now I want you to turn to um, John chapter 1, verse 31, 33. And this is John talking. He says, I, uh, in John, John's telling the story about John the Baptist himself. He says, I, didn't, I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. In other words, I'm going to show Israel what really is the kingdom by baptizing in water and showing them what's going to happen to Jesus Christ. Did you know that Jesus hadn't died yet on the cross? So he's prophesying what it's going to look like when you change your mind about the kingdom. He hadn't died on the cross yet. He hadn't risen from the dead yet. How did he know to bring him down into the water as a symbol of death on the cross? And raise you back up as a symbol of life. Oh, wow. Do you understand? It was a prophetic act. This is what's going to happen. I don't even know yet. But when he comes, I'm going to know because of the dove. Right. That's right. It was a huge prophetic act baptizing people. Yes. And the one, the reason you're going to get baptized is because he's going to come. He's going to come. I'm, I'm not real sure. I mean, I know he's my cousin and everything, but I, I don't know if he's really God. But I'm going to know it because the dove will come out of heaven and it'll land on him. And when that happens, I know that he's really God. See, a lot of this was done in faith, too. Yes, absolutely. A lot of this was done in faith, too. Right? How would you like your cousin to come to you and tell you you were the son of God? <laughs> okay. How do I know? You're the son of God. 
focus member, my mom, we've talking to your mom in the temple, and when she mentioned your name, I wept in the belly, remember that? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? A lot of this is fame. <laughs> remember the stories, Jesus, about that? John 131, I did not recognize him. I didn't recognize him. But so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descend like a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He whom you see the Spirit descend on and remain on, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah. And some of your versions say fire. So let's just get it straight. Jesus was the one. And John finally goes, that's the one. Okay? Everything I'm doing here is not in vain. Shoot. That is the one. <laughs> okay. Now, when we talked about fire, Jesus baptizes in fire. There is a fire from heaven that is the exact opposite than the fire from hell. Think about that. Hell's fire destroys God's creation. Heaven's fire destroys the work of the devil. devil. Yes. Hell's fire brings torment and everlasting devastation. And heaven's fire brings purification and everlasting passion. Yeah. Matthew 3, 12. His winnowing fork, talking about Jesus, is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear the threshing floor, and he will gather the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That fire is hell's fire. Hell's fire is ashes and soot. Say that. Ashes and soot. Heaven's fire is healing and deliverance. Do you see Jesus is the one who will baptize us in heaven's fire? He's the only one worthy. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Jesus now came, while you're turning there, I'm going to read one more for out of Matthew. It says, and he will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But he's talking about the wicked, and he's talking about hellfire. In hellfire there's weeping and there's gnashing of teeth. But in heaven's fire there's joy, and there's dancing, and there's rejoicing, and there's worship. What fire do you want to have? Yes. Heaven's fire. And I got good news. Jesus is here to give it to you. Whoa. Bring it, God. Bring it. Okay, we're in, uh, we're in Acts 1, verse 4. Gathering them together, just as Jesus, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised him. Which he said, you heard from me. For John baptizes with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus was getting ready to pour out his fire on his believers. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him. Wow. You guys feel that? When they come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time? you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power, say power, power. when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness, say witness, witness. both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. What is Jesus concerned with? He's not concerned with revealing the plan of God to everybody. 
He's concerned that they get power yes. to be a witness, to be a... Shut up. <laughs> Basically to be a witness. Say witness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> when do we have the power? To be a witness. Oh, to, be a witness. Oh. Wow. to bring in the fold. To be a witness. Now, what I love about this is when it says he commanded them, what this means is he did, three, he did three things in those verses. He commanded them, he corrected them, and he commissioned them. Right. Say command. command. His command was this, wait for the power. Just wait. He corrected them because what did they immediately say after that? Yeah, but tell us what the Father's going to do. Tell us, is this when you're going to restore us? Oh, is this, what's going to happen next? When's the end going to come? And there are just all these questions, Jesus, Jesus. And, and what did Jesus say? He then corrected them, didn't he? What did he say to them? He said, it's not for you to know. Basically, do not ask me that. What did I tell you? I said, wait for the power. See, a lot of times we want the whole revelation of God without the power. God doesn't want to send you out on that street without power. You'll get eaten up alive. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He wants us to have the power so when we go out, release is happening. People are saved. They're healed. They're delivered. They, yeah, you're laying, on the, you're laying hands on the sick. They're recovering. Amen. You're speaking to a person who has a demon, and they're getting delivered just by your words. Hasha ba 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 shata. So he corrected them when they started asking too many questions. And then he commissioned them. He said, go, get the power, be my witness. Get the power, be my witness. You're going to start here in Jerusalem. Then you're going to go out to Judea. And then I'm going to send you way out to the ends of the earth. God's all about what? The harvest. The harvest. First where? Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. In Sparks. Right here. Near Loma Park. Rock Park. You know, right here. Fourth Street. Wherever. Right here is Jerusalem. He's about to harvest. Then he's going to send you into Judea. You know, some of you who actually travel, you know, you might be on a cruise in the Caribbean. And someone might ask you about Jesus and you're bringing in the harvest in the Caribbean. You know what I'm saying? And then some of you might vote in Cambodia with you. We're going to bring in the harvest in Cambodia and Africa and all to the uttermost parts of the earth. How many of you want to start here in Reno and end up in Africa? Okay. And Cambodia. That's pretty good, too. Now, what I want to do here is I want to show this video. Can you guys cue the video up and don't show it yet, but just get it big and ready to go? All right. Now, one more thing I want to read you before I show you this video. Wow. Acts 18. Turn to Acts 18. Now, this is a story about Apollos, Priscilla, and Aquila. Aquila. I'm going to start in verse 24. And now, I don't want you to... Um, Mistake the fact that you can teach the word without the fire. How many of you know that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You can even lead someone to the Lord yes. without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not that you can't do it. You can. You can do it all. There's a lot of great people out there that don't have this fire Jesus is talking about. But let me show you the difference. Acts 18, 24, 25, 26. Now a Jew, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. Say mighty in the scriptures. Mighty. Mighty. Verse 25. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in his spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. This guy had been baptized in water. That's right. Awesome. Acts 18, 25, 
18.26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But, say but. but. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I believe. They took him aside, and they explained the baptism of fire to him. Because yes. he hadn't been acquainted with that one yet. <laughs> he didn't know he could be baptized in fire by Jesus. He just knew he could be baptized in water by John. And he was eloquent, and he was an awesome teacher, and he preached with fervency. But he didn't know about the fire. And Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, look down to verse 28. <laughs> For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now, when you look in the scriptures and you read everywhere, it talks about demonstrating what's happening. You're raising the dead. You're healing the sick. You're, you're casting out demons. You're demonstrating the power of God. What happens to you when fire comes on you? You begin to what? Demonstrate. Jesus didn't need another good teacher out in the world which you can be without the fire. But if you want to raise the dead, sister, yeah. you want to lay hands on the sick and every time have them recover, if you want to cast out a demon who's in front of you, what are you going to need? Power. The fire. You're going to need the fire of heaven to do that. How many of you want to be able to do that? Yeah. How many of you want to have signs follow you everywhere you go? Yeah. You're going to need the fire. Now, some of us have the fires just a little bit. <laughs> kind of little embers, a little bit here and there. It's just about hanging on and doesn't go out. Sometimes our passion wants to go out a little bit, huh? What do you do when your fire is going out? <laughs> you know, you know, some that. you know how to do that. You fan it a flame. You get it stirred. You might have to put some more wood on it. I think the Church of Jesus Christ right now, they're just kind of got some little coals ready to need some blowing on. Sometimes that's all it takes. Just rekindle that fire. Don't they have those, what are those called? The you know, I just get a hair dryer. <laughs> have you guys ever just gotten a hair dryer out? Pretty that thing. But that's what we need. Nightline's Vicki Mabry reports on the science of speaking in tongues. <laughs> practice mentioned in the Bible. St. Paul called it speaking in the tongues of angels. Jesus' apostles were first said to do it at Pentecost. The technical term is glossolalia. Most people call it speaking in tongues. There's a vast number of people out there that because they did not personally experience it or have been taught against it all their lives, there's no way they have an ability to embrace it. So that's common. We're still mocked and made fun of. That's not stopping Pastor Jerry Stoltzfus or others in his congregation at the Freedom Valley Worship Center in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, from using what they say is a God-given gift. It's almost as if I'm able to tap into God's heart and what he wants. I get goosebumps, actually. You can feel him all around you, and you can feel him speaking through the words that you're saying. It almost sounds like a foreign language, but actually, those who speak in tongues are not saying anything in any known language. 
with the gift of tongues i can trust the holy spirit to figure out what needs to be healed he will use what sounds like gibberish like any other language sounds like gibberish he will interpret that for his purposes and his uses we say things in our own english language but speaking in tongues is a heavenly language that we're going to god and jesus intercedes for us they say they have no control over what comes out of their mouths that they're swept up in a rush of ecstatic religious feeling and that the Holy Spirit is speaking through them. Do you hear yourself? Oh, yeah. Sometimes I think I sound like a total idiot. <laughs> it's almost all in yellows and red here. At the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Andrew Newberg is looking for an explanation for what most regard as unexplainable. I mean, it's not language. It's not regular language, at least, that would normally activate the frontal lobe. Newberg is exploring the relationship between faith and science, studying what happens in the brain during the deepest moments of faith. We're really going to look at this very, very powerful force in human history of religion and spirituality. I think we really have to take a look at how that affects our brain, what's changing or turning on or turning off in our yes. brain. They're going to go around very fast right now. He's recently published a study of Americans speaking in tongues. Remarkably, he discovered that what's happening to them neurologically looks a lot like what they say is happening to them spiritually. Make sure we got your whole head in there. We asked Pastor Jerry Stoltzfus to come to the university to have his brain scanned while he speaks in tongues. This way, we could see the experiment in action. I don't think faith is anything to be afraid of from science. Science validates faith. So bring it on. Whatever the facts are, bring it on. Just go ahead and, and you can begin prayer. First, he's told to pray in English. Father, I pray for each of the family members involved in this study. Grant them what they are looking for in their personal lives, for their vision and their potential. Then he's told to speak in tongues. This is the first scan when he was in prayer, speaking in English. This is the second scan when he is praying in tongues. Pastor Stoltzfus's scan showed that his frontal lobe, the part of the brain that controls language, was active when he prayed in English, but for the most part, it fell quiet when he prayed in tongues. When they're actually engaged in this whole a very intense spiritual practice, religious practice for them, their frontal lobes tend to go down in activity but I think it's very consistent with the kind of experience that they have because they say that they're not in charge. They're, it's the voice of God, it's the spirit of God that's moving through them. Dr. Newberg says the results were even more dramatic on subjects who were scanned without a nightline crew in the room and who were not speaking in tongues on demand as Jerry Stoltzfus had done. Good. Study participants like Donna Morgan first listened to music then went to where the spirit took them. When I heard about the study, I already knew within my spirit that it was going to be proven that there's a part of our brain that we have no control that when the Holy Ghost is interceding for us, we're out of control. In earlier studies, Dr. Newberg looked at what happens in the brains of Buddhist monks meditating and Franciscan nuns praying. And it was noticeably different from what happens to tongue speakers. That's in fairly stark contrast to the people who are like the Buddhists and the Franciscan nuns who are in prayer because they are very intensely focused. And in those individuals, the frontal lobes actually increased activity. But Dr. Newberg isn't out to prove or disprove anything. He can tell you what happens in the brain, not why. Were you skeptical going into the studies? If by skeptical, the question is, is this a real phenomenon, meaning that this is truly the voice of God speaking through them, that's a much more problematic question, I think, and something that I'm not sure that we've specifically answered simply by doing our study. 
But for those who believe, it doesn't matter if science can find the footprints of the Holy Spirit in their 21st century brain scans. When you've experienced this, you don't really care what anybody else thinks. It's personal for, in the first place. It is something between you and God. So we don't really care if it's validated or not, but it's fascinating when it is. So that people that have thought we're crazy can have something to look at to say, maybe we're not. We're still crazy. We're just not as crazy as they thought. <laughs> this is Vicki Mabry for Nightline in <clears throat> Philadelphia. The gray area where fact meets faith. Isn't that awesome? God will not be mocked. <laughs> That's so awesome. Jesus, thank you. Hallelujah. I love the part that this part up front is supposed to sleep. You know why? Because your spirit is praying. Your mind is not anymore. And when he says you lose control, I, you know, I, I think what they mean, because I know I'm totally in control when I pray in tongues and when I don't. But I'm not in control of what I say. I believe that's what he means. So those of you that have received that fire in that heavenly language, you know you can start at any time and you can stop at any time, right? But you're not in control of what you're saying to God. And what's cool about that is the Bible teaches that when you pray in the spirit, because you are, you're not praying in your mind, that's why it goes to sleep. How many of you want a better rest? <laughs> pray in tongues before you go to bed, right? Yeah. Um, but because the spirit is praying, not your mind. Amen? I love that. And he says when the spirit prays, he always prays according to the will of God. So sometimes you don't know how to pray. Anybody always, sometimes you don't know how to pray, right? Pray in the spirit. Why? Because the Spirit knows how to get in touch with God. Amen? Because it's His mind. So we want to pray the mind of Christ. Okay. So now, what I want us to do is I want to, uh, one more thing. I want you to turn to Acts 19. I love this. Is it a heaven or hell issue? Praying in tongues. No. no. How are you saved? By grace. By grace. Through faith. In Jesus Christ. The resurrection, the blood. You're saved by the blood. Amen? Yes. Amen. I don't believe it's a heaven or hell issue. What I believe is it's a obedience issue. Yes. What did Jesus say? Wait until you're what? Baptized with fire. Okay? And it's also, I believe, uh, it's an obedience issue, which is number one. You got to be obedient. To God. It's got to be obedient. You know, you just have to be obedient. Number one. But it's also an issue of, of victory. Yes. Victory living. Okay. Why would having a baptism in fire by Jesus, having a language where you can literally just pray to God anytime, and you know you're always praying the will of God, always. You never pray in this when you pray in the Spirit. Did you know that? Yes. Ever. So how, what would that have to do with victory? Think about it. Anybody? Why would that be a victory issue? You're on target. You're praying exactly what you're supposed to pray. Holy Spirit knows how to deliver you out of that thing. Right? And so because Jesus is up in heaven interceding for us but he's not really praying down to us what he's doing is he's praying to the father for mercy for us see Jesus intercedes for mercy on our behalf why? because he died on the cross he did not die in vain and sometimes, I still believe sometimes God's up there oh yoy <laughs> what do I have to do? And I believe part of the intercession is Jesus like, nails, feet, nails. I died for them. I died. I died. Remember the blood. Remember the blood. And Jesus is like, okay, the blood. Yes, the blood. Okay, mercy. I really believe a lot of our intercession is just because, you know, God's like, whatever, dude. I don't know what else. I said, I thought, what else do I have to do? You know, and Jesus is like, I did it. Don't. It's okay. Don't. Kind of like Jesus stands in the place like Moses did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't Moses kind of a, mm -hmm. like a, a tyrant? 
type of Jesus, right? So I say all that to say, mm -hmm. Jesus is interceding for us. So he intercedes for us on the behalf of mercy. I believe most of his intercession is mercy for us, okay? Yeah. But we intercede, partner with Holy Ghost, and Holy Ghost takes those prayers woo, up to the throne, up to the courtroom, because that's where they are, making righteous decisions on the earth. That's another message. But takes them up to the courtroom and woo, puts them before the judge. Yes. Do you see we have Holy Spirit interceding with us through the Spirit, through the prayers of, of, of heaven? It's not that he doesn't listen to our English prayers. But the Bible says we pray amiss so much when we pray in our mind. Uh -huh. We just pray amiss. You know what I mean? That's right. So it's not that he won't listen to us praying English, but do we really know if we're praying the will of God? I mean, if, if, we, if we're praying according to the word, we do. But how many of us really know the word really well? Do you understand? So we're just limited in our English prayers, that's all. Where when you pray in the Spirit, it blows the top off. How many of you have felt like, A, you don't know what to pray, B, you're super heavy, like you have this thing on you, like, ugh, but then you go into praying in the Spirit, and all of a sudden, little by little, you just kind of start rising up like, Amen. And breathe yeah. again. Yeah. Okay, I can take another step forward. I'm not going to drown. I'm actually, I don't know what I said, but I know you do, and this is good. <laughs> what you just experienced is in Jude when it says, pray in the Spirit always, always. and build up your most, most holy, holy faith. faith. Do you see? So, so those of us that know how to pray in the Spirit, I think God's saying, turn it up, turn it on, turn it up and turn it on, because we are in weary days. We are in days that the devil is just out to wear Amen. us out, yeah. and he does his job. In all fairness, he does his job pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> How many would agree with that? Yes. Yes. Okay, you got to give him that much credit. He, can, he deserves nothing, but if you were going to be like Jesus and even have mercy on the devils, you know, he did when he sent him in the pit. You know, that was a merciful act. Yes. Oh, yeah. Woo, y'all, looking at me like no. Jesus doesn't have mercy on the devil. No. <laughs> Change 
my mind about the kingdom. Verse 4, Paul said, John baptized a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is in Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak with what? Tongues and prophesy. They were all about 12 men. How awesome would that be? Yes. Holy Spirit? I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. <coughs> and, John, and Paul's like, well, let me tell you more. In fact, let me touch you. <laughs> and they all got filled with the Holy Spirit. And they got their language and they prophesied. Okay? So there's the point. You can be a disciple and a believer and not have baptism of fire. You can be that. You're still going to go to heaven. You're still going to go. Okay? Uh, but they believed, but they had not yet heard the Holy Spirit, so that's possible to believe in Jesus, the resurrection, but have no clue what the Holy Spirit's about. Anybody know people right now in your life that believe in the resurrection but have no clue what the power of the Holy Spirit is about? It's okay. It's happened here. Number three, uh -huh. receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. And then you speak in tongues. It's just one of the, you know, it makes sense to me that tongues would be one of the manifestations of a holy God coming and taking you to another level yes. in fire. Because, number one, tongues is the least of all the gifts. It only really helps you. That's okay. Just turn to your neighbor say, it's okay to help me. <laughs> and then turn to the other one and go, because if I'm not very good, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs>